So we have three fantastic panelists. Uh, I, uh, uh, one of them I just met this morning, and, uh, but she's no stranger to most of you, I, I think, if you're from this area. Uh, um, on the end there is Lisa Graves. She's the executive director of the Center for Media and Democracy here in Madison. In the middle is Ray McGovern, who is a, uh, a former uh, recovering <laughs> CIA analyst. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, thank you all so much uh, for coming out so early in the morning to hear what may in fact be a very depressing uh, <laughs> set of information about the military industrial complex and the, mil and the media's complicity in it and other really important information, some of which you may know and know well and some of which may be new to you. Um, but I'm certainly honored to be here and I was pleased to meet Leah and honored to be invited to this panel by Matt Rothschild as well from the uh, Progressive Magazine. Um, as Leah said, my name is Lisa Graves. I am the Executive Director of the Center for Media and Democracy. We are located here in Madison. We were founded in 1993 by John Stauber, an activist who has been uh, involved in a number of issues over the last several decades. And I became the Executive Director in 2009. Um, and uh, just a little bit to give you some context, I suppose, um, not, uh, not for uh, other reasons of self-promotion, but just so you have some context for my experience. Um, I was Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the United States Department of Justice. I was in the policy shop of the Justice Department uh, under both uh, Ms. Reno, Janet Reno, the Attorney General, and for a time, uh, as, because I was a career, a career staffer of the Justice Department at the uh, leadership level, uh, for a time, I was Deputy Assistant Attorney General under John Ashcroft before September 11th. In the spring of 2001, I helped brief the new administration in uh, to, uh, as part of the transition uh, of government, the peaceful transition of government from the Clinton administration into the Bush administration. I left the Justice Department uh, shortly after John Ashcroft came on board. <clears throat> and uh, there are stories we could talk about over drinks, I suppose. But um, it was it was uh, it was a it was a an interesting and surprising experience that perhaps we may talk about at some point. But um, I actually went to the U.S. court system where I was uh, deputy chief of the Article Three Judges Division, which uh, dealt with all of the United States uh, judges. And uh, I, uh, after September 11th, I then was asked uh, shortly thereafter to become the chief counsel for nominations for the United States Senate Judiciary Committee working for Senator Patrick Leahy. Uh, in that role, I worked for over three, about three years uh, on helping to put together the filibusters of the worst of the worst Bush judicial nominees uh, against uh, a lot of naysayers that said the Democrats would never stand together, would never stand up to the judges that the president wanted the most. Some of the people we helped block that the senators uh, said no to included William Haynes, who was then the general counsel of the Defense Department. The idea that we could amass a, a set of senators, Democratic senators, to stand together against the general counsel of the Department of Defense, becoming a member of the Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, and then perhaps on the United States Supreme Court, was unpredicted. And everyone said it wasn't possible, but we did it. We did it. There are other people that we did block uh, and that and were blocked under my time and then after I left who got through, including John Roberts, got through to the D.C. Circuit despite my um, efforts to shed light on his record and obviously he's on the United States Supreme Court, uh, much to my chagrin, I was not there when he was confirmed. Uh, after um, uh, the election in 2004, I became, um, I was asked to become the uh, chief uh, lobbyist for the ACLU on the Patriot Act, um, and I left. Uh, I left the Senate to uh, become the senior counsel for legislative strategy for legislative strate strategy for the ACLU, uh, and worked to put together what was the unprecedented filibuster of the Patriot Act 
in 2005. That work was done in coalition, a wide coalition of groups, um, and that work, uh, I worked a lot on the House side uh, of the equation, um, to the lobby bar with the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee, uh, and then um, worked with allies across the nation, uh, in, including perhaps some of you in this room who worked to oppose uh, the reauthorization of the Patriot Act, which we held off despite efforts by the Bush administration to reauthorize it by July 4th of uh, 2005, by September 11th, the anniversary of 2005, by the end of this year of 2005. And at one point, we had 51 senators, Republicans and Democrats, standing together against the reauthorization of the Patriot Act in December of 2005, which was unheard of. It just goes to show what you can accomplish when you actually aim for something. <laughs> Uh, but in that week, the warrantless wiretapping story broke in the New York Times after being held back for over a year. And uh, shortly thereafter, the Bush administration, along with the Director of National Intelligence um, and the telecom companies, pushed for, um, pushed for the extension of the Patriot Act, which has been extended again uh, in the recent years. Uh, I then worked for the uh, Center for National Security Studies uh, on the warrantless wiretapping issue on the violation of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Uh, statutes as well as the violation of our Fourth Amendment rights uh, and ultimately in 2009 I was asked to become uh, the executive director of the Center for, Na Center for uh, Media and Democracy which as you may know uh, wrote the, the first comprehensive book in the summer of 2003 that documented the propaganda that led to the run-up, uh, the authorization of the war in Iraq. That book is called Weapons of Mass Deception Weapons of Mass Deception, that book is available on our website, our main website, which is prwatch.org. Uh, things you might not know if you haven't read that book. Uh, the, the famous uh, picture about uh, uh, the Saddam Hussein uh, statue being toppled in Tahrir Square. Uh, the long shot of that picture, uh, not a lot of people all around uh, the square. Um, the short shot. Uh, was used to make headlines saying, you know, basically Iraqis from all over have joined in uh, and have, in essence, welcomed uh, the equivalent of welcoming the U.S. troops with roses and laurels as, uh, as um, Rumsfeld and others proclaimed. In fact, the long shot, not to, not to denigrate at all the fact that they did pull down that statue, but as we all know, uh, it was not as though um, the uh, occupation, the war, um, went smoothly and has gone smoothly. So a uh, couple things uh, before I get into some more uh, details, I should say. I'm also the president of the Bill of Rights Defense Committee's board. Uh, John Nichols gave us a very generous uh, shout out last night. The Bill of Rights Defense Committee was uh, founded by an activist named Nancy Kalanian. She, on a shoestring budget, helped put together with communities across the country and allies, including the ACLU, over 300 resolutions at the city uh, and town level against the Patriot Act. They were powerful. Uh, they didn't succeed in getting all the reforms that were needed in the Patriot Act, but that effort, those local resolutions, exerted a lot of pressure on some politicians and were instrumental. And so I, I would say that experience demonstrated the power of local individuals standing up and saying, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to just stand idly by while our civil liberties are reversed uh, in this wholesale, uh, widespread fashion. Uh, the Bill of Rights Defense Committee is now led by Shahid Buttar, who is a very dynamic and exciting leader uh, who's been working closely with communities of color uh, to in, and, and uh, people from all religions and uh, races and walks of life to ensure that uh, going forward as we move to uh, roll back, ultimately roll back, these uh, tremendous uh, incursions in our uh, fundamental rights, that that coalition is a, is a diverse, uh, vibrant, local coalition uh, that reflects, reflects people from all backgrounds. Um, and uh, George Friday is the organizer uh, for Bill of Rights Defense Committee. You probably heard from her last night. And she's been doing tremendous field work uh, on that. Um, and I also have worked this spring with one of our uh, law clerks at the Center uh, for Media and Democracy, Brendan Fisher. This spring, in the midst of our reporting on the Wisconsin protest, the Wisconsin labor uprising, in the midst of our work uh, to prepare to expose the American Legislative Exchange Council. AlecExposed.org is our most recent website. We uh, also worked collaboratively on a project called The Costs of War. The Cost of War.org is the website. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the findings from that. But our expertise 
the expertise that we brought to it was primarily on the cost of war in terms of the human cost, the civil liberties cost, the human rights cost, but there's a lot of information that I'll share with you briefly in a bit about that site. I hope you'll go to that site. You probably haven't heard of it from the mainstream media, but it has a lot of useful information on there about the true cost of the wars over the last decade. So before I um, talk about a couple of sort of details or numbers, because I am a, uh, I'm a hopeless researcher, I really can't help myself, I just have to read, read, read. I'm actually um, not as uh, outgoing as I may appear. Uh, I am uh, just as content to read um, uh, things like the uh, full set of the, of the, the church committee, uh, the congressional committee's findings about uh, national security <laughs> surveillance from cover to cover, um, things that not everyone has the time or patience or desire to actually do. Um, but that, that, I think, is a good grounding uh, to talk about a bit of this, and I will definitely talk about the media, but let me talk a little bit about um, those findings and the current situation we find ourselves in as a result, in many respects, of the failure, the failure of the media to be a robust skeptic in the face of claims uh, about national security, about al-Qaeda, about uh, the war at home and abroad, um, and uh, an array of claims by both the Bush administration primarily, but also the continuation of some of those policies by the Obama administration at the urging of the, of the national security infrastructure that has emerged since September 11th. Um, one of the things that was most surprising to me, and it may not be surprising to you, but it was surprising to me, was that in reading the findings, the, in, the, the result of the in-depth investigation of a strong and robust skeptical Congress in the wake of revelations by tremendous journalists like Jack Anderson and others about the spying that was going on by the Nixon administration and by previous administrations of the American people, that one of the findings, among many I could tell you about, was not just that Martin Luther King was extensively surveilled using electronic surveillance and other measures, which many people know and many of you uh, may know uh, uh, in lots of ways uh, from that time, but the fact is, uh, two facts I would share with you. One is, it's quite clear that, that the rationale for surveilling him wasn't just that he was a civil rights leader and a powerful, important, influential civil rights leader. It was that they said that he was a threat to the domestic security of the United States, and the basis of that was primarily the notion that he dared to have friends who they considered to be socialists or communists. And so therefore, because he had friends, uh, not that he was a communist himself or was advocating in any sense the violent overthrow of the United States, in fact, he was advocating the opposite, the nonviolent, peaceful, affirmation of the commitment of the 14th Amendment of the United States to the people of the United States, because of his friendships, they used that as a basis to monitor him secretly without warrant, without court supervision, without oversight, and to do so extensively. And we are in a time in which those powers have been reinvigorated in many respects, with some internal rules that are supposed to protect us, but with vastly expanded technology that was unimaginable in the 1960s. And the second thing I would say, just because I think people ought to know, is that as a result of this extensive surveillance of Martin Luther King, including of his hotel rooms, his home, uh, his meetings, uh, there is in fact in the file in the, in the United States Congressional Record a letter that was written. Uh, it's written to Dr. Martin Luther King and it was written <clears throat> just uh, a few months, almost basically two months, before he was assassinated. That letter, in essence, is if the implication from the surrounding record it is, it is that it is from the FBI. Uh, it's, an, in essence, a, a letter that says, uh, if you do not step down from this movement, based on our surveillance of you, we will discredit you, and in, in discrediting you, we will discredit the movement. So make no mistake, in this country, in this country, as many of you know, extensive secret surveillance powers have been used to try to chill dissent, to thwart dissent, to in essence blackmail leaders of movements that dare to demand 
that our democracy live up to its values. Right. So let me fast forward to this week's recent news uh, about the um, training of the New York City Police Department uh, by the Central Intelligence Agency or through the Central Intelligence Agency and what that means sort of in a, a broader context. Um, Part of uh, what we know is that there's an incredible movement within the U.S. that's called police intelligence, uh, the police intelligence movement. Uh, there are some, I suppose, positive things about the police intelligence movement. There are some very worrisome things about the police intelligence movement. And in essence, what we've seen erected uh, since September 11th has been a return to some of the Red Squad, what were called Red Squad policies, uh, in terms of the police surveillance of people within the United States who have done nothing wrong, who committed no crimes, who, on which there's no probable cause basis for arresting them or searching them, but in which through the policies of the Los Angeles Police Department, the New York City Police Department, and other police departments, often in coordination with a new infrastructure that's been put in place called the Fusion Centers, which seeks to fuse all threats intelligence, seeks to fuse criminal inf information, criminal information as well as uh, uh, information, civil information, information that they can purchase from uh, data mining, data um, conglomeration firms, uh, military intelligence, including some National Guards and others who've been posted at those fusion centers to fuse information about uh, the people within the communities who, um, who may be threats in their view because they're active. And we know from uh, Freedom Information Act requests that have been filed by the ACLU and other organizations that fusion centers, as well as um, the infrastructure that the FBI has put in place called Joint Terrorism Task Forces, JTTFs, have in fact deployed this technology, deployed these uh, powers on peaceful protesters, people who have broken no law, who have only dared to express their First Amendment rights, people who uh, are Quakers, pacifists, people who, who have um, uh, been uh, spoke, outspoken against the war in Iraq, who've been troubled by the media and the government's rush to war in Iraq and, and beyond. Uh, people, Catholics uh, in, in, uh, in um, Pennsylvania uh, from, the, from the Thomas More Center. Uh, Muslims, obviously, uh, given uh, all the rhetoric and, uh, and the, the, the Al-Qaeda um, focus. Um, and uh, also environmentalists. Uh, anti-nuke activists uh, in Maryland, uh, an array of people who dare to speak up. And so we are at a time in which the media uh, has not been, in essence, the friend of civil liberties. It has been an aider and a better of, a, of, of the growth and expansion of a surveillance infrastructure that has tremendous consequences for our rights, has already had tremendous erosion of our rights, and also that means that while we can take heart in uh, the use of social media in, in Egypt, to organize people to rally peacefully at the use of social media within the US, in Madison, to, to, dis, to fill in the gap left by the terrible coverage by the national media for the most part, uh, with the exception of the Ed Schultz show and, and Amy Goodman uh, from Democracy Now! and, and a handful of others. Um, we know that though those new technologies which provide great promise to us also have the potential to be shut down as we saw most recently in San Francisco with the BART, as we've seen in, in London uh, with the protests there, and that we have to have, we have to both deploy these, uh, this new technology, these new uh, uses, ways for us to connect with each other, to share information, and to defend our rights, but we also will need to have other mechanisms as we go forward uh, into the next uh, uh, four to eight years to communicate with each other that aren't just electronic that aren't just electronic. Um, so, <sighs> I've got one right here, here. sorry. Uh, I've got candy. So let me, let, me, um, let me focus on maybe three more things. Do I have five minutes? Ten, ten minutes maybe? Okay. Um, maybe five to seven minutes, right? Okay. All right, no, it's true. So um, I'm not sure how many of you have read uh, one of the great uh, one of the great writings uh, of George Orwell. I'm not going to say 1984. I'm actually going to say his his uh, piece on uh, on language and politics. Uh, it's a very powerful piece. It talks about 
the, the power of language, the power of language to cover facts, to hide facts. Villages were bombed, you know, is one of his famous, by who? Mm -hmm. Who bombed oh. those villages? The, the actor is often missing. Uh, if you haven't read that essay, I would urge you to read it. Um, you know the terms I'm about to say, and yet the media has embraced them fully in an effort to accommodate the language being used by the Bush administration and then on into the, into the Obama administration, as well as an effort on their part, in essence, to sound sophisticated, uh, to sound in the know, um, and uh, on the part of some of them who've really been co-opted. Uh, and I'm not just talking about Judith Miller of the New York Times, uh, although we could talk about Judith Miller of the New York Times, um, but uh, uh, who, have, who have basically uh, been embraced in this 24-hour media cycle to go on CNN and just bloviate and repeat uh, terminology without thinking. So we all know that enhanced interrogation, you know, means torture. Uh, it meant torture back in 2001 and 2002 when they were working on uh, undermining and, in essence, deleting our national long-standing commitment to the Geneva Conventions. But I don't think we should use the words enhanced interrogation at all. Why use those terms? My view, and I've told this uh, in meetings uh, at the University of Virginia to, uh, to uh, uh, legal officers uh, from all branches of the United States military, is uh, to quote Potter Stewart, Stewart, who was one of the, uh, or to paraphrase Potter Stewart, who was one of the justices on the United States Supreme Court in talking about obscenity, he said, I know it when I see it. Torture, you know it when you see it. If waterboarding your mother or daughter or grandson or nephew or niece or neighbor, if you think that was torture, uh, it's torture. Um, we don't need some sort of fancy legal definition cooked up by John Yu, one of the extreme reactionary men who should never have been allowed a position of power and authority that he was in coordination with Dick Cheney and his operation. We don't need his legal rationales to rationalize that. Uh, that's torture. It's been torture since the Spanish Inquisition. It was torture when the United States of America prosecuted Japanese soldiers for engaging in the same against US soldiers during World War II. And it was torture in 2001, 2002, and it would be torture today. Detention. You know, it's imprisonment. You can call it whatever you want. People who are detainees are not just detained. <laughs> Couldn't get there on time. Couldn't get there on time. They're delayed, <laughs> missed the bus. I was detained. <laughs> they, I waited the protest. They are in prison. They're in prison. They are not even in jail. They're in prison. They cannot get out. They've most likely been imprisoned without a trial. Without a trial, which is one of the fundamental precepts of the American system. Now, there is this distinction between military law and time of war on the battlefield when you'd have to have a trial right there to detain someone, in essence, to imprison someone. But obviously, you know and I know that that definition has been broadly expanded to authorize widespread detention policies that we all know well with Guantanamo Bay, but secret prisons and other enterprises over the past <laughs> 10 years, and including some perhaps for profit enterprises. But um, rendition, kidnapping, really? I mean, Rendition. So now in the Clinton administration, there was a thing called lawful rendition, which actually was to pick someone up to bring them to justice. It was called rendition to justice, which meant capturing someone and rendering them, bringing them to justice. So that it could mean bringing them to trial. It could, bring, it could mean them bringing, to, bringing them to a military brig to face charges. Uh, it meant seizing a person, otherwise known as arresting, uh, seizing a person and bringing them to justice. On that basis, the Bush administration expanded the notion of lawful rendition to just rendition to wherever they decided to render. There isn't there some sort of you know uh, parallel word in the butchering industry or something? Yes, but yes. To render someone, yes. uh, to render someone, and in some cases, those people were perhaps they might say those who perished or were tortured. They might say that they were rendered in some fashion. Extraordinary, extraordinary rendition. Extraordinary, meaning very extra fine. legal. Yes, very fine. Extraordinary. It was amazing. <laughs> no, it was not extraordinary. Uh, it was not just rendition. And in many instances, it was, in fact, kidnapping in violation of international law and US law. 
Uh, surveillance, um, connecting the dots. <laughs> this is actually one of my favorites because my expertise is actually in surveillance uh, policy. Uh, connecting the dots, I think of a, a, a childhood book where you're just connecting the dots, right? You, it makes sense, who wouldn't want to connect the dots? We must connect the dots. The dots must be connected. But if you think about what's happened since September 11th, is that um, we know from an inspector general investigation that was insisted upon by the great senator from Wisconsin, Senator Russell Feingold, <laughs> whose voice and observation as a member of the United States Judiciary Committee as well as uh, a member of the United States Intelligence Committee is sorely missing since his departure. Uh, due to the efforts of Senator Feingold and others, we actually obtained the first ever Inspector General investigation of the Federal Bureau of Investigations, powers under the Patriot Act using the, what's known as the National Security Letter, the National Security Letter. That investigation by the Inspector General revealed that the FBI was using powers expanded by the Patriot Act uh, in what are known as NSLs, which are secret letters that go to banks, insurance companies, uh, your internet service provider, telephone companies, um, and other entities to demand your, quote, transactions, meaning the people with whom you communicate, the people, the, the numbers of the phone, <coughs> the phone calls you make, uh, the people you communicate with by email, uh, the money you spend in your bank account, uh, to, to use those letters uh, to gather information uh, not less than 30,000 times, in essence, as the Bush administration lied to the Washington Post about, but in fact, uh, hundreds of thousands of such letters, of such demands, it would be the way to put it, such demands, because some letters had thousands of people or phone numbers in them, uh, hundreds of thousands of such demands were made by the Bush administration, and in fact, the inspector general said those tools which before September 11th had focused upon uh, a suspected agent of a foreign power, meaning and including a terrorist that was expressly in the statute, an, a foreign terrorist or an agent of foreign power, focused on a target of such an investigation. Now those letters can be used, uh, in essence, uh, starting from 2001, those letters can be used whenever it may be relevant to an authorized investigation. And Ashcroft uh, tweaked that language to expand what might be an authorized investigation to sweep in all sorts of people. Obviously, that's why the numbers are so big. But what the investigation revealed, and this is, I believe, important, is that the FBI was using those powers to sweep in the data, your private data, uh, of people who were two or three steps removed from the target. So you think, well, OK, I want to find out who Mohammed Atta is. I want to know who his roommate is. That's one degree of separation, who's two degrees of separation, who's three degrees of separation. That is the scenario that they spun out for you. But if you think about it in real terms, think about this. Assume you are in contact with 500 people a year. You're in contact with 500 people at this conference. But let's just say, for a conservative estimate, you have 500 people that you encounter throughout a year. Your first degree of separation is 500 people. Your second degree of separation is 500 times 500. If you can do the math on that, that's two, five, zero, 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 zero. 250,000 people are within two degrees of separation of you. The power to use these powers to sweep in enormous numbers of Americans and their data, their communications, who they're in contact with, is significant. It cannot be underestimated. But that, when they say electronic surveillance connecting the dots, Think about how many dots there are. There is not a page of paper that can, that can contain those dots. It's not a childhood <laughs> connecting the dots. If you put all those dots on a piece of paper, the paper would be black. The paper would be black from end to end. And that isn't even counting the expanded powers of the National Security Agency under the changes to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that were forced through by the Bush administration with the help of the Director of National Intelligence and the aid of the lobbyists of AT&T. So language matters, but have you heard about so much of this from the, the mainstream media? Some, but perhaps not all of it. The mainstream media should have been covering these issues, should have been skeptical about these issues, was not, did not, 
and has in many respects aided and abetted this agenda, this incursion of our fundamental freedoms. Uh, I, do have a, I do have a bonus gift. It's my Texas Law Review article uh, about, uh, about, the, about the right to privacy in the wake of um, some revelations from the Project Minaret program, but also the Bush administration. So if you're interested, I've got 10 of them, but there's more available online. Um, let me just conclude my opening remarks by talking with you about a couple of numbers that I think you should know about that the media has not told you about. From our Cost of War, our Cost of War project, which is part of Brown University um, and the Eisenhower Research Program, it's cost, costs, plural, of war.org. Uh, this data is from other scholars other than, uh, other than the center, but the information about from that indicates that the true cost of the Afghanistan-Iraq war is up to $4 trillion. $4 trillion, there's data on that. The estimate is between $3.2 trillion and $4 trillion. Since we're talking about trillions with the sudden, the sudden obsession with a deficit, <laughs> an obsession that did not exist, oh, on tax day 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008. $4 trillion. Uh, that project, the co cost of war, indicates that it, perhaps 225,000 lives from all parties, all countries, have been lost. That more than uh, more than 30, uh, more than 31,000 uh, people in uniform from either the U.S. but counting other military personnel, are in essence our opponents, have been killed. Um, that that uh, there have been perhaps seven million refugees created through these uh, wars, um, that $185 billion, $185 billion has already been spent in interest for the war that was financed without increased taxation by the Bush administration. $185 billion, billion in interest. And uh, there is an estimate that over the next 30 years, we could end up uh, having to pay almost $1 trillion, basically up to $950 billion uh, in uh, expenses to care for the veterans, uh, for their health care, uh, for, their long, for their military service care beyond war injury care uh, into the mid-century. It won't peak. That amount won't peak until mid-century. Time to go. Okay, so... Uh, so in, I, I suppose I would say, just in conclusion, those are just the numerical costs, not the cost of human rights, not the cost of civil liberties. And that doesn't even begin to tell you the details on the actual budgets you know, for the D Department of Homeland Security, the, uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, the National Security Agency, and the, and the infrastructure that has been put in place, not just to monitor people abroad, but to monitor people within the United States some of whom, many of whom, most of whom, have never been and will never be charged with any crime whatsoever. Those are my opening remarks.